All right, so I got a lot, as usual. Um, I'm going to try and breeze through this so I can get us off um, at a good time. Whew. So let me just start with this. We have a, um, two announcements, kind of. Um, so first, you're going to be hearing more about this if you are a part of the church. And if you are um, in the church chat, we are going to be um, doing properly socially distanced prayer meetings now. So, you know, you guys know as a church, we meet um, every Wednesday. We've been doing it since the beginning of the church. We'll always do it. Um, and we are, uh, what are we doing? We're going to be meeting um, in person for those who want to meet in person. It'll be no more than 10. If it's more than 10, we'll break up into separate groups. Uh, we'll do it outside. We'll make sure that we're socially distanced and that we're abiding by the laws of the land. Um, but I also want you to know um, this is for this is something for um, you if you're comfortable with doing. Um, if you if you're not in faith for it, if you don't feel comfortable, um, even if you're not afraid, you just don't think it's wise. Um, then by all means, this is not like a challenge for you to to come out and test your faith. That's not what we're doing. Um, we will also provide the same option that we've been doing for you guys who want to just do it via video. Um, we'll make sure that that's available as well. But for those who want to do it in person, we'll make sure that we were able to do that. So just stay tuned for that. First announcement. Second announcement. Last week, we finally got a chance to, to begin doing a Bible study on spiritual gifts. This week, we will do it again. It'll be this Saturday at 11 o'clock. If you're not part of the church and you want to be on that, you are welcome to. Um, just DM us or get with a friend and they'll give you details on how to get into that. Um, yeah, so let's go ahead and hop right in. I'm going to start by praying. Lord Jesus, I, I, um, I thank you for this immense opportunity to speak to your people. Just went on the Lord for a sec. Father, I, I thank you that you have brought people here. But God, even in this moment, I am very aware that this is just something that we do. Yeah, this is just something that we do in the body. We're used to sermons, um, especially for, for those of us who have church people in our family. We were raised in the church, have ministry background. This is something that we're used to. Um, so it's very easy for us to hop on the live, but not necessarily be listening. It's very easy for us to listen to the recorded sermon and not really be listening. Father, I pray that you would help us to have eyes to see and ears to hear, that you would help us to care about the things that you care about, Lord, that you would help us to view this time as holy, that we would see that the words coming out of my mouth, Lord, are from you um, and whatever is not, God, that you would take away, God, help us to reverence this time, God. Pray this in your mighty name, Jesus. Amen. So very quickly, open up to Ephesians 4. As you guys know, we have been in Ephesians 4 for weeks and weeks and weeks. I hope you're not bored yet, <laughs> but um, it's important because it's going to give us a great foundation to um, where we're at. So Ephesians 4, I'm going to go 11 through 16. It says 11. And he gave some as apostles and some as prophets and some as evangelists and some as pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of service to the building up of the body until we attain to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the son of God to a mature man to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. As a result, we are no longer to be children tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness and deceitful scheming. But speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body being fitted and held together by what every joint supplies, according to the proper working of each individual part, causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. What I just read to you, in my opinion, is, is one of the most important 
pieces of New Testament scripture that we have, because in this, it gives us both the, the goal of God and it gives us the means of how he's going to accomplish his goals, his visions, his missions in the church. So what's it saying to us? And we've been going over this, but I, I have to continue to tell you because I've been, I have been following the Lord, not, not perfectly, but I've been trying to follow the Lord for at least 20 years. And, um, the one thing that I can tell you is if you ask most believers, what does God want for their life? It strangely agrees with right with what they want for their lives. And sometimes there's nothing wrong with that. But sometimes um, that is you could be right, but it doesn't get to the foundations of what God has for you, what what he has planned for you. And in Ephesians four, it tells us this is what I want for you. So just a second. I just feel this pleading in me. I don't know why. But I feel this pleading, if you're a believer, to listen to what this has to say, because in this, God is saying, this is what I want for you. So in verse 12 and 13, we see, well, 12 through 16, we see God, God's will for every one of his children. And in verses 12 and 13, it's his, his vision, his mission, his, his goal for you. I want you to make this personal and hear this from the Lord. His goal from you is that you would be equipped to serve, that you will be edified. That means built up. That you ready for this one? That you will be in unity with the rest of the body of Christ, that you would know Christ and that you would mature to the point that people would see you and you would be a picture of Christ to them. In verse 14, he tells us that the maturity that God has vision for you means that you would be steady. That your faith and your peace wouldn't be tossed around by the waves of life. That includes coronavirus, but not just coronavirus. It means not being able to pay bills. Interpersonal conflicts. Political changes or staying the same. That no matter what happens in this life, that you would have peace, that you would be steady. Verse 14 also tells us that you would have a, that God's vision for you is that you would have a firm foundation when the winds of false doctrine come to deceive you. Or when really handsome, really cool preachers come and they tell you something that's a little bit off of what the Bible has to say. And they try and lead you to a God that somehow looks different or Christ that doesn't match the one in the Bible, that you would be mature enough that his vision for you is that you would stand firm in what God has already told you about himself. Verses 15 and 16 tell us that God wants you to be a son or a daughter that speaks the truth to your brothers and sisters in Christ and that you would do so with love. That you wouldn't just be a leech on the body of Christ but that you will be a joint that helps supply power to the body and that you will grow together with the rest of us. Those are the goals. Like, let me ask you, like, if you're watching this and man, I feel like I should just stop and, and teach on that. Like, there's so much of who God wants us to be in these little verses. And as I'm reading it, if you're like me, there are some things that I'm have to say, you know what? I got to clean this up because if this is God's vision, that you will be in unity with, with other believers if this is God's vision, that you wouldn't be always prone to, to, to anxiety and stress, that you will be steady and you're not matching up to it, it doesn't mean that you don't have the power to it. It just means maybe you don't even, either you don't know or you don't actually care. And that's the problem. If you don't look at your life and you say, you know what, when Jesus, does, Jesus would, would handle this this way, and you know for a fact you would handle it the other way and you don't care about that, you should probably rewind and go to other sermons and figure out maybe something's wrong. But for some of us who we want to be like Christ, for those of you who want to be like Christ, for those of you who want to grow and not just grow so your life is okay, but grow so that you would actually match the vision that God has for you. He gives us what that vision is in Ephesians 4, 12 through 16. He shows us the goal, but in verse 11, he shows us the way that God has ordained for us to get there. And that is, he gave some as apostles, some as prophets, some as evangelists, some as pastors and teachers. 
This is how God has equipped the church to be everything that he wants us to be. This is why this, this scripture is absolutely amazing to me because we don't, it means that we don't have to build the church like a business. We don't have to try and match, you know, a, a franchise formula to build a church. We don't have to go to the successful church down the street and, and pick their brain and figure out how did you get this thing done? It means that Ephesians 4 tells us this is how God has ordained the church to be built. And so I've talked about apostles and prophets and evangelists. And this week it's time to talk to and about the shepherd. And what's so interesting, in my opinion, the shepherd gifting that God gives here in Ephesians 4 is, is the one that most mirrors God's heart towards his people. So I'm going to talk to you about the role of a shepherd. But while I do it, I want you to hear past just the information. And I, and I want you to see God's heart for you. And if you need to, I want you to take a second. I want you to quiet your mind if you need to take a sec and pray to God, it's so important that you hear God's heart for you. As, I've, as I have followed Christ, as I've seen, I've discipled people and taught people, the one thing that is so true about almost every believer is nine times out of ten, nine times out of ten, if people are struggling in their faith, it is something that God has already told them about his character and about his love for them that they simply don't believe. So when we go through the gift of shepherd, we're actually going to get a chance to see God's heart for his people. And so I want to I want to actually start in Psalm 23. That's Psalm 23. And I'm going to pray again while I go through, or before I go through this, because it's so important. Now, I, I, I. Let's be clear. I say it every week, but I want you never to forget this. When you approach God's word, when you approach teaching, when you approach truth, when you approach the gospel, understand that there's every force of the enemy that is getting you to not pay attention, that is getting to distract you, that is trying to get in your way so you will miss out what God is trying to say to you. That is the nature of what we do. It doesn't mean, you're, it doesn't mean that you have a hard time understanding things. If you have the spirit of God, you have the mind of God, so it's not you it's it's the world around you so i'm gonna pray you should pray for you i'm gonna pray for me and i'm gonna pray for you lord jesus you pray for me too god we need your help right now we pray that you would speak mightily god that there would be nothing that i have written in this ipad that would get in the way of your voice Nothing in my mind that would get in the way of your voice. Nothing in this environment or the environment of those who are watching that would get in the way of your voice. That you would speak mightily. That you would speak clearly, Lord. And I know you'd be faithful so that I know that you will. And I thank you for the authority that you've given us by the death of Christ and by his authority. We cast out every single spirit, every assignment of the enemy that would seek to block the word that you have for people today. God, I thank you that you are mighty. I thank you that you are all powerful. You are the most high God. We just submit our time to you. I submit my, my, my words to you. I submit my mind to you. Yeah, Lord, I'm so excited for what you have. So Psalm 23, I'm going to go one, verses 1 through 4. Listen to the Lord's heart for you. And, and I want you, I don't want you to just read this like it's a textbook. I want, David is speaking, but I want you to put yourself in what David is saying. And this is what he says. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. As we look at the role of shepherd, let's start here. If that's in your Bible and that's not highlighted, my goodness, this is this is huge. I'm, this is not even what I'm teaching from. And this is huge. In verse one, we see that God being our shepherd, his desire is that you shall not want. Not that you may have every more than what you need. It's just that you should not want that. He's going to take care of your needs. It says that he lies, he makes you lie down in green pastures. If you don't understand that, the, the imagery here is 
God is the shepherd. We are the sheep. Green, green pastures, green grass. That's where we, that's where we eat. That's what sheep eat. Grass, pasture. And the greener, the better. The greener means it's more healthy. It means it's not dying. God's provision is that he leads us into a place where we will be taken care of, that we don't have one. In verse 2, it says that he leads me beside quiet waters, besides still waters. What that means is peace. It's God's desire that you would have peace. In verse 3, it says that he wants us not to just have a good outer life, but a good inner one as well. He restores my soul. Like, listen, like how many times are we going to have to see rich and famous people kill themselves until we finally believe that maybe if I have all of my physical needs taken care of, it may not mean that my soul is OK. I mean, when Robin Williams killed himself, that should have been like Robin Williams built a career on comedy. Aren't the funny people supposed to have joy? And yet he killed himself. And people still think that if they had his budget, if they had his, his income, that their life would be better. But here, God says, I'm going to take care of you, but it's not just the outside. I'm going to take care of your soul. He's not just going to make us comfortable. He's going to make us righteous. He's going to give us peace of mind that comes from obeying the Lord. Peace of mind that comes from being right with God. Then in verse four, he, we see that he wants us to be safe. No matter the environment around us, though I, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil. Like that's such like a tagline that like that's like a, a, a verse to get tatted on your chest. Like, yeah, it sounds hard. But like, let's just be honest. How many of us have been looking face to face with death or have been worried about death before and had no fear? This is God's heart for us. This is what he wants for us. And he, he calls himself the shepherd because this is his goal that he would have his flock like this, that they would be in peace, that they, would, that they would not want, that they would be protected. And so how does he do that? Well, when you look in scripture, you see that God has always led his people as a shepherd. But he doesn't do it from the clouds. He raises up men led by him to shepherd his people. Perfect example of this is Moses. Everybody knows Moses. He's born and uh, he's, he's given away and I'm, I'm paraphrasing and he ends up in, in the house of Egypt or in the uh, royal house of Egypt. He's the Pharaoh's adopted son now. Ends up, a bunch of stuff happens. He leaves and he flees because he murders somebody. And um, you fast forward in his life and Moses gets called by God. And, and what, is it, what does he do? What is he doing with his life when he gets called? What is Moses? Lo and behold, when God calls Moses, he finds that Moses is a shepherd. And I promise you, the Bible doesn't have coincidences. Every single letter, every single word, every single punctuation is there for a reason. So when God calls someone to lead his people out of danger, he calls a shepherd. So as you know, you fast forward, Moses goes and he brings his people out, God's people out. And now they find themselves in a desert. And, and when Moses... Gets the children, of, gets the Pharaoh to let the children of Israel go. <laughs> Lo and behold, this one lowly shepherd who didn't even want to do it at first, who said, I'm not the one to do it. God still calls him. He calls him to 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 be a means of his grace. I want you to shepherd my people who I'm the shepherd of. God calls him and he, he works great miracles and they, they come out of Egypt. <laughs> and Moses looks up. And there's over a million people. That Moses is the shepherd of. And God sends wise men to counsel Moses and they say, listen, bro, you cannot. I'm paraphrasing. It doesn't say bro in the Bible. Um, listen, you cannot be the shepherd of all these people yourself. What you need to do is delegate authority to other people so that they can shepherd the flock of Israel better. And this is just 
This is just a picture of multiplication. This is what God is doing. He is multiplying his care as a shepherd amongst his people. He finds someone and he says, boom, I am, help- I am, um, um, what was the word? I am, oh, I just dropped out of my head. I'm delegating. There you go. I am delegating some of this power and authority to you so that you can lead my people, not from the clouds, but there face to face. And then when he looks up and it's a million people, Moses does the same thing God did. He delegates authority. So now the the tribe of Judah doesn't just get all the love, but now the tribe of Benjamin can. And now the tribe, all these different tribes can get help and they can have real and practical leadership. Because God is a real and practical God. He doesn't lead his people from the clouds. He never removes the human connection. So when God seeks to be a shepherd of his people, he delegates authority to other men who are supposed to be led by him. The problem with shepherding or or God delegating this authority is that there's always going to be an element of error. And here's why. Because he is using people. He's using sheep to shepherd sheep. And one thing, if you've met people, you will know that sheep are weak and inevitably we will mess things up. And I want you to hear this because this is very important. Because when we talk about God using men to lead men, the problem arises is two. One is us. The Bible is very clear. We have something in us. It was in our it was in our nature before we were saved. And it, it's not in our nature anymore, but it remains in our flesh. And what it is. We do not like to listen. That's just who we are. God has restored us. He's changed us, but we still have the same leaning. If you talk to a to a to a vegetarian and you figure and you ask them what was their favorite food before they became a vegetarian. Most of the time, they if you, they talk about it, they're still going to say, man, it's still good. They may not eat it. But that flesh is still there. It's the same thing with us. When we talk about men leading us, the first thing that happens is we do not want to listen. We do not want to follow. That is normal. That is a normal thing in people. You don't have to teach children to disobey. It's normal. We were all like that. Every single one. The second thing, the second problem that we have is sheep leading sheep isn't a perfect strategy. And sometimes people fail. And this is what I feel like I need to say to you. If if as I go through shepherding, I want you to understand something. God knows and he sees and he understands that you have not been led well all times. Whether it's been your family, whether it's been a church, whether it's been a job, there are some of you who can point out ways that people have abused their leadership in the past. And I want you to hear something in Ezekiel 34, because God actually looks upon the shepherds of Israel and he has judgment for them as to how they're leading his people. And this is important because I want you to understand that God does want you to submit to leadership, but it's not that you just submit to any old thing happening to you. That God knows that some of you who are a little bit worried about saying, I'm going to, I'm going to obey. He knows why, and he wants you to know that he cares. So listen to this, and I want you to fully feel the anger of God behind this. I know that sounds crazy, but if you read your Bible, the Bible has no problem with anger. The Bible never says anger is wrong. The Bible actually says be angry, but sin not. What that means is you should be angry at some things. As a shepherd, I can tell you there have been things that have happened in the church where people have been misused and abused in the church, and my first my first feeling was anger. I was angry at it. Now, the sin would have been if I would have went in there and grabbed people out by their neck. That would be sin. But the anger of it is OK. And you need to understand that sometimes the anger of God fits. See, you are God's sheep and he cares for you. And I want you to feel his anger towards those who have led his sheep wrongly. So Ezekiel 34 says this. I'm going to read the first 10 verses. And I want you to really hear this. Then the word of the Lord came to me saying this to Ezekiel, son of man, 
prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to those shepherds, woe, shepherds of Israel who have been feeding themselves. Should not the shepherds feed the flock? You are the fat. You eat the fat and clothe yourselves with the wool. You slaughter the fat sheep without feeding the flock. Those who are sickly, you have not strengthened. The disease, you have not healed. The broken, you have not bound up. The scattered, you have not brought back. Nor have you sought for the loss. But with force and severity, you have dominated them. They were scattered for lack of a shepherd, and they became food for every beast of the field and were scattered. Just pause for a second. That breaks my heart because I know that that's people. I know that there's people who have so much insecurity in their living situations, so much insecurity in their personal relationships that that's what they feel like. They feel unsafe and scattered to the wolves. Then he says in six, my flock, Wandered through all mountains and on every high hill, my flock was scattered over all the surface of the earth and there was no one to search or seek for them. There are some of you, your entire life, you feel like you have looking for you have been looking for someone who would love you correctly or you have always been around people who have treated you bad and treated you wrong and that, that, that you have always been around people who have misused you who have abused you and it's important for you to hear this god is not okay with it i understand that god is all powerful but i at the same time i want you to understand that though god has called these shepherds here to 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 shepherd his people god does not lead robots he allows free will and sometimes that free will means that people do things outside of the will of god and i want you to understand that though god can make all of those bad things work out for good it was not his original plan for you to be treated like that for you to be abused, for you to have those problems, for you to be left out in the cold like that. That's not his plan. And in this verse, you see how God feels about it. He's not playing with these shepherds. Verse seven, he says, therefore, you shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. As I live, declares the word, surely because my flock has become prey, my flock has even become food for the beasts of the field. And they lack a shepherd. My shepherds did not search for the flock, but rather the shepherds fed themselves and did not feed my flock. Therefore, thus says the Lord, behold, I am against the shepherds and I will demand my sheep from them and make them cease from feeding sheep. So the shepherds will not feed themselves anymore, but I will deliver my flock from their mouth so that they will not be food for them. This this prophecy still stands today if there are people who are who are under shepherds that are are feasting off of them and not feeding them understand that this still is there for you what i love about this is god's response keeps coming and keep going in ezekiel 34 god's response is this listen to this in verse 11 he says behold i myself will search for my sheep and i will seek them out Praise God. See, this is what's so, so awesome about this. If you, if you know anything about other religions, there is no God like our God. You understand that other religions, they, they, they position their gods to sit there and come and to be served. And if you want to be right with God, there is something that you need to do. You need to get up and go fix it. There's a, there's a mountain of God to climb and you need to go up and get it. You need to, to figure it out. And if you're in trouble, you better figure it out because he still needs a sacrifice. But our God is the God that says, I will do it myself. I will come and I will get my sheep. I'm not putting the onus on the sheep to come to me. I see the problem with like, I'm not bashing, I'm just being honest. The problem with other religions, it never deals with the fact that we're all sheep and we're all weak and we're all scattered, we're all broken and we need help. And if the shepherd doesn't come to the sheep, how will the sheep ever not be lost? And every other religion says that the sheep has to figure out how not to be lost, how to find themselves back to the God. There is no compassion in it at all. There's no realism to the fact that unless you are hyper disciplined, you ain't gonna make it to heaven. 12, he says, as a shepherd cares for his sheep in the day when he is among his scattered sheep, so I will care for my sheep and I will deliver them from all the places to which they were scattered. 
Man, God has such a heart for his people. Now, keep in mind, like, this sheep that he's talking about, <laughs> this is, these are buck wild sheep. Like, these are people who are difficult. But yet, God sees the lack of leadership. God says, I am the shepherd. I have delegated my authority, and this is what you guys are doing. God tells us that the sheep that he has raised up to shepherd his people are failing him and his people so he will instead come and shepherd his people himself. He says, he's, what he's saying here is, I will come and deliver my sheep from these bad shepherds and I will be their good shepherd. But how does God do this? He says he's going to do it. If you guys know, if you've been reading ahead in your Bible, you know the answer is always what? Jesus. See, the problem with God saying, I will come, I will lead my sheep, is we skip pictures all throughout the Old Testament that God is holy, he's powerful, he's righteous, and if you step into his presence with anything that is not perfection, you're done. He even, he even says times in scriptures, make sure these people don't come close to me. Make sure they don't even touch where my presence is. Otherwise, just, just, just my glory will come and strike out. Because I'm holy and they are not. So how is this holy God, this perfect God, this pure God going to come and shepherd unclean sheep? He tells us in, in Ezekiel 34, 23 and 24, he says, I will set over them one shepherd, my servant David, and he will feed them. He will feed them himself and be their shepherd. And I, the Lord, will be their God and my servant David will be prince among them. I, the Lord, have spoken. Now, is he talking about David? We know he's not talking about David. Number one, this is after David has already died. If you've been following on for the last few years, one of the covenant, the last year, one of the covenants that God gives coming uh, to David is that the Messiah, the one who's going to come and save the world, is going to come through his line. This is what this is what he, he's referred to as the son of David or, or David himself. But it's not actually David. It's the Messiah coming through the line of David. Sorry, real quick. <laughs> so what's happening here? He's talking about the Messiah. He's saying you have been exposed to bad shepherds. I myself am going to come and I'm going to be the good shepherd. But when I come, it's going to look different because I'm coming as one. I'm coming as a man. My servant David, which means I'm coming as the Messiah to be the good shepherd. This is my son. My servant is coming. That's Jesus. And so what's interesting about this is, this is not just me. If you were early Hebrew in that time, you would have read this and understood fully that this was about, this was a, a, a Messiah prophecy. And because they knew their Torah, they would have known this. They would have understood this. They would have understood Ezekiel 34. At that time, once you got to be a man, in order for you to be a man, you had to memorize the Torah. You had to know what was in your word. Manhood and maturity had to do with you actually knowing your word. So everyone who was listening to Jesus would have understood Ezekiel 34. So when Jesus steps on the scene and proclaims in John 10, starting in verse 11, he says, I am the good shepherd. People would have rejoiced. He says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Jesus appears again as a model of apes, apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds, teachers. He appears as a model of a good shepherd. And he is the perfect and good shepherd that was talked about in Ezekiel 34. But then guess what? <laughs> He leaves. <laughs> he leaves. And now he's seated next to the father. So what happens? Do, are we now supposed to be just led from the clouds? No. Instead of shepherding the flock in a new way, what Jesus does is he restores the same process as to how God did it before. Instead of just leading from the clouds, Ephesians 4 tells us that he raises up shepherds to lead his people. Again, he delegates authority says yes so he, may, he even says himself I make one, sh one flock with one shepherd but what he does is he delegates that authority that's why when he's risen from the dead and he's talking to Peter and Peter just denied him he brings Peter to himself and he says Peter do you love me Peter says yes what does Jesus say to him then feed my sheep 
only shepherd's feet sheep. He's delegating his authority as a shepherd. You're under me, but feed my sheep. So we're to follow Jesus, we're to be led by him. But God is doing it differently in these days. Not that he's not delegating authority, but now the shepherd is supposed to be a gift from Jesus, which means that now we are empowered by the spirit. See, the new covenant, the new covenant is that God will put his spirit in you so you would walk in his ways. So in the new covenant, the shepherds have the spirit of God so they can shepherd like God. Doesn't mean perfect, just like you, becoming a Christian doesn't mean perfect, but it, it sure means you got a better shot than Moses did. And if you don't believe me, check your own Bible. Jesus said, Jesus said, huh, whatever. Understand something. When we get to Ephesians 4 and we see that one of the gifts is a shepherd or pastor. Pastor is just, is just it has a Latin, um, a Latin um, background. And it means, it, it's from a Latin word that means to pass, to lead out to pasture. It's the same thing as shepherd. Um, but we see that these new shepherds are supposed to be a means of grace from God. It's a way of you getting the, the, the same shepherd from, from Psalm 23 into your own life. Shepherds are called to lead in God's power by his direction and lead the sheep deeper and deeper into the good shepherd. First Peter five calls Jesus the chief shepherd. This is why it's so important for those who are pastors of a church to have a clear and solid calling by God. Not, not that other people thought they would make a good pastor, not that they could teach, not that they could preach, not that people like them, that they're good at counseling, but God himself has called them to pastor that church. Otherwise, you have to question what power they're doing it in. The number one question to every preacher is, who sent you? Every pastor, every person who says that they were going to lead a church, the number one question you need to ask when you're looking for a church is, who sent you? And if they tell you some board, if they tell you some organization, eh, wrong answer. It needs to be God. Has God called that man of God? If not, I would say maybe not go there. So how do we deal with this? How do we understand this gift of a shepherd? First, we have to understand that we need to really value this gifting. And I'm not saying that because I'm a pastor. I'm saying that because if you don't value it, you are boxing yourself out of being shepherded by the Lord. Here's what I mean. I'm not going to read it again because we've, we've read it over and over. But in 1 Corinthians 12, it talks about this. It says, you're all individually part of God's body. But then he says this, but God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers. Now, the teacher, in my opinion, I think when you go to Ephesians 4, it's, it actually has pastors, teachers slumped together. And I think it's because the, the two roles can occupy the same position. So some people call it the fourfold ministry. I don't really care if you call it fourfold, five, whatever, as long as, as, long as that, those roles are working. But I, think, I don't think when he's saying first, second, and third that he's ruling out pastors. I think he's just including them in there. And if you have more questions, you can ask me later. But the reason why this is so important is because when the reason Paul breaks away from the body and he and he says, you're all part of body, but the church understand that the body and the church are different. They're not different people, but they're different ways that God has 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 called us to be together. If you get saved, I said this last week, if you get saved, you're part of the body. But the church is a, is a Greek word, ecclesia, that means the assembly. It means when the body actually congregates together. So I said it last week, but I'll say it again. It means that just because you are part of the body of Christ, it does not make you part of the church because you need one or two people to assemble. Yes, in person, but if you can't assemble in person, if you assemble online, that makes you part of a church, makes you part of the assembly of God. The reason why this is so important is because pastors slash shepherds, they are called to lead the assemblies of God. The church is the assembling of the body of Christ in local and practical ways. It's where, where you can receive the practical love of God. The practical help, everything that we read in Psalm 23, 
Those things should be happening practically in the church. Every believer needs to be a part of assembling of believers. So let me give you three ways that God shepherds his people through the gift of the shepherd. First, when God calls shepherds, he calls them to lay down their life. And this is so important. In John 10, 11, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. If Jesus is our picture of maturity, if he's our picture of what we should be, it doesn't change when you now are occupying leadership that was given to you by Jesus. If Jesus gives you the role of a shepherd, he wants you to do it how he would do it. And Jesus laid down his life for his sheep. So and just so important, because when we talk about a shepherd or pastor, you can use either word. When you talk about a pastor. Like, this is not just my bias because I'm a pastor. This is just, it's always been the case. It, it's almost as if we are so familiar with the gifting that we don't give the, we don't give the office the same reverence that we would an apostle or a prophet. Now, keep in mind, I'm not saying reverence to men. I'm saying reverence to the office. In some, in some folds, they understand the fivefold gifting. They understand APES. They understand all that. They operate with apostles and prophets. And in some of those circles, it's so interesting. It's like when the apostle is coming into town, it's like there's a hush over the crowd. Shh, the apostle's here. It's like here comes the real anointing of God. But God doesn't separate that in his scripture. He's saying these all, you should have reverence for all of these. Why? Because they are all different ways that I'm leading the church. And what's so specific about the pastor role is that a pastor is called to the day to day life of the flock. The shepherd is there. The pastor is there day in, day out, leading the flock. There is an intimate knowing between the sheep and the shepherd. Y'all, if you are not a part of this church or if you're a part of this church, Begin to set your expectations on how you should be led. The shepherd, the shepherd, if a shepherd is leading a flock, he knows which of his sheep are sick. He knows, okay, this is the temperament of that sheep. This sheep is going to act like this. If I say this to this sheep, this sheep is going to do this. A shepherd would know that because a shepherd knows his flock. And Jesus says, my sheep hear my voice. Do you know why? Because they've heard it all the time. The, the, the sheep know the shepherd like the shepherd knows the sheep. Yeah, it happens fully in Jesus, but there should be some facsimile of that in the church. There should be an intimacy between the shepherd and his flock. See, uh, there's so many people and so many, especially young dudes. It just doesn't sense to be a young dude thing who they feel this calling to teach or preach. That's fantastic. But you know what you need before you start a church, before you lead a church? You better have a calling to shepherd, a calling to know people. Your, your job is not to just fly in on a Sunday, yell at people, and then fly back out. Your job is to actually love your people and serve them in the way that is best for them. That is what being a shepherd, that's what being a pastor and not just a teacher. A shepherd sacrifices. Laying down your life means that you give up certain things so that you can lead the flock well. You, you know the difference is, and I have this somewhere, but I'm going to say it now. <laughs> Being a shepherd means that you are not called to a particular ministry. You're not called to a particular emphasis. You're not called to a particular leaning. You're not called to, to, to a particular calling. Being a shepherd means you are called to particular people. That's the difference. That's the difference. So what that means is if you are a pastor or you are a shepherd and your desire, your heart's desire, the call of your heart would really get you going. Whatever you say, you're, you're, the things that excite you are the things at the top of the mountain, but you don't have a flock that's built to go to the top of the mountain. A shepherd doesn't just leave the flock to, to do what they want to do. A shepherd equips the flock so everyone can go up the mountain. <laughs> That's the difference between an apostle. An apostle goes, you better come. If you want to come, you better put on your boots. Not a shepherd. A, she a shepherd sometimes slows down for the sake of the flock. 
A shepherd doesn't want to leave any of them behind. A shepherd makes sure that all the flock is okay, not just the strong ones, not just the dope ones, not just the ones that agree with everything that he says, not just the ones that don't give him a hard time. A shepherd cares for all of the flock, even the, 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 the nappy ones. Those are the ones whose fur is all nappy. <laughs> So let me ask you this, just real quick, and I don't want to like boom anybody, but I'm going to boom you. If, if the Bible has this type of intimacy between the pastor and, its, and, and the flock, if I was to ask the pastor of your church, let's say your name's Frank, if I was to ask, hey, what do you think about Frank? And that pastor says, who's Frank? How are they your shepherd? That's so important because some of us, we, we are committed to organizations where there is really nobody shepherding us. We're just there for a message. The Bible has not, is not saying that good teaching is, is wrong, but that's not the way that God fully wants you to learn. That's not the way he fully wants you to, be, to help. He wants you to fully be led, not just by teaching, but also by someone who is day in, day out, who knows you well enough to care for your infirmities. How can someone pastor you? Well, how can someone shepherd you when you're sick if they don't even know you to know that you're sick? Some of it is you can get the right message. You can get truth. But you're prideful and nobody knows that and talking to you in 15 minutes. Some of it, yeah, you're getting everything that you want. Like You know the word back and forth. You got everything memorized, but you're sleeping with your girlfriend. And unless somebody knows you, they're not going to be able to call that out. But a shepherd is around his sheep. So this is not, that, that's not a knock against mega churches because some mega churches have figured this thing out. I used to go to a mega church and um, at the time they had like 30 pastors, but it was, it was their attempt to try and shepherd the flock well. That doesn't mean that that's how everyone has to do it, but you have to figure it out. We're a tiny church, so it's, e it's easier for us to shepherd. But as we grow, we will not grow if we cannot shepherd well, because I want to be in God's will, not out of it. Even just discipleship. Discipleship is an extension of shepherding God's people. Second, God calls shepherds to protect the flock. Jesus says in John 10, 12, he says, he who is a hired hand and, and not a shepherd, who is not the owner of the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. Guys, this is one of the chief jobs of a shepherd. Listen, sometimes pastors, especially if you go outside of like, um, like um, church stuff and you just go to like, you know, Christians who attend events and all this stuff. There's like this negative thing about pastors or even like parents, honestly. Um, there's this there's this idea that like the more you the more you have people out like doing the risky stuff, the better you are. And, and, and that may be true from an, from an apostolic leaning, but from a shepherd's leaning, the shepherd is there to actually protect the sheep. And there is nothing wrong with that. Let me ask you this. Sometimes we say, oh, we, we don't want people to be bubbled. But if, they, if, you're, if your flock is surrounded by wolves, don't you want to bubble? See, we look at protection in this, this view that if you need protection or if you want protection or if you want to protect people, that somehow makes you weak. The problem is we're thinking like Americans and we're not thinking like God's people. God has called you to be a sheep, which means that you, you feel more safe around the flock and you need a shepherd because you need protection. That's not popular. But guess what? I cannot go against what scripture says. And... Before we judge, and, and I'll be honest, like that's not my leaning. So often people say things and they do things in the church and the theology is just like, bruh, like have you even read the Bible? Like my, my, my number one, the first emotion that comes to me, I'll be, I'll just be honest. The first emotion that comes to me is, dang, I hope they figure that out. <laughs> like that, like that's, because it is, it is not my leaning to just go and like you had a Bible, like, I have a part time reading the Bible. Like, I'm the slowest reader I know. I didn't start out reading the Bible loving it. I just read it because I knew that God was speaking through it. So, uh, for me, I'm like, bro, hasn't this person read the Bible? Like, what are they doing? Like, figure it out. 
But I've had to rebuke that because I know that part of my job as a pastor of a church is to protect people from false teaching. So I've, I've learned to, to not judge the pastor who wants to protect his sheep especially when you realize the immensity of focus in the New Testament about guarding the flock from wolves. In Matthew 24, 11, Jesus warns and he says, many false prophets will arise and mislead many. This is one of the things he's saying that's leading up to his return. He said, one of the things that's going to ramp up before I come is false prophets, false teaching is coming. And he, add, he, he, he exhorts us to be alert. The Apostle Paul, he planted the church in Ephesus and he led them for about three years. Then he established leaders in the church and he begins to continue on as an apostle does. He continues on to find new ground when the gospel has not been preached. But he leaves behind an assembly that's led by shepherds. And he doesn't say, hey, you guys are soft. <laughs> or, or, hey, you guys are, you, you, you know, you're too, you're too cautious. He, he says, no, look, listen to what he says in Acts 20, 28 through 30. He says, be on guard yourselves and for all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. Listen to what he says. He says, Phew. he's saying this to the church. And, and Ephesus, when we get to Revelation, Ephesus is is the uh, most healthy church so far up until Revelation. There's, there's still a problem with him, but listen to what he says in verse 29. He says, I know that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. He says, and from among your own selves, men will arise speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after them. Because of that, therefore, be on alert, remembering. He says, look at what I did. Night and day, for three years, I did not cease to admonish, that means exhort, to build you up, each one with tears. You know what Paul is saying? He's saying, you are shepherds, you cannot sleep on the job. That is part of who you are. God has called you to guard his people. I shared the story, but I'll share it again. So, as, so my, my first job as a, as, is to shepherd my family. I'm a husband and, a, and, and, and I'm a father. It means I shepherd my family. What that means is I am constantly on guard for them. I am constantly praying for them. I cannot tell you the amount of times where they have had this revelation or they had this issue, and it was the very things that I prayed for. I remember one time um, I was up at night, as I often am, at 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock in the morning, and I'm praying for my son and, and um, I'm praying out, out in the living room. But I felt like the Lord said, I need you to go and I need you to pray over him protection. Don't know why he needed me to do it, but I just did it. It's my calling. So I did. I went and I prayed protection over him. The next day I get a call from my wife saying that Elijah was in the backyard with some kids and they were <laughs> they were calling demons down for whatever odd reason. And he didn't feel right with it. So he left. And he went and sat on the curb by himself rather than to be back there where they're calling demons down. A shepherd is supposed to be on guard. This was when he was five years old. So it's not like what led him. It was the Holy Spirit that led him out. And God called me to be on guard. What if I wasn't on guard? What if I wasn't at my post? The same thing is for pastors. Yo, there are so many people, and, and not just me, some of you have experienced this in the church. You prayed for people and they were, who were going the wrong way, and then finally, somehow they just decided to go the right way, but in their eyes, it's just their own decisions they're making. But it was your prayers because you were on guard. You were alert. A, pa a, a, a pastor, a shepherd has to look further than the sheep does. A shepherd has to be more concerned about the well-being of the sheep than often the sheep are. Sheep will eat grass all the way off of a cliff. And if you try and pull them back, they will resist you because they're, they're focused on where they're at now. It's your job as a shepherd to see further than they see and to have greater understanding than they understand. That's the purpose of a shepherd. Not so you can lord it over them, but so you can be alert. This means the rod and staff. You know what's so interesting about Psalm 23? It's such a, it's such a 
ooh, it's so good. Like, yeah, the Lord is good. And that's good. But in, 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 in Psalm 23, 4, it says that um, <laughs> his rod and his staff comfort me. What's so interesting is those are tools of, of like correction. <laughs> like the rod is used to fend off and, and to beat anybody that would come in. Like it used the rod to beat up wolves or bears or whoever would try and come eat the sheep. You would beat them, but then you would also use the rod for sheep. When the sheep weren't paying attention, the Bible actually has a high view of the rod. It's, the, the Bible says, the Bible says that um, <laughs> he who spares the rod spoils the child but you can use that just for it's the same thing it means that we are not called to just be as loving as we can in one way loving sometimes mean that if the sheep are going in a way that the shepherd will actually discipline the sheep and david said that he saw the rod that as as comfort the staff was sometimes they would go off and the staff would just bring them back or if they were, they were lost, they would hold the staff up and the sheep would be able to see the staff to know where the shepherd was. <laughs> Lastly, God gives us shepherding gifts. So this is third. So let me just remind you three ways God shepherds his people through the gift of the shepherd. One, he causes shepherds to lay down their lives. Two, he calls shepherds to protect. And then three, he actually gives shepherding gifts. So it's not just the gift of the shepherd himself. He also gives us spiritual gifts that help a shepherd. He's given us the shepherds to help us equip the body. So here's what I would, here's what I would challenge you. Your shepherd, learn from them. Learn from them on how they lead. Learn how, how, how to care more. This was me, man. Like, I'm still, like, God, this is the biggest weakness that I have. And I look at people who shepherd well, and instead of, and not perfect in this, but instead of me looking at them and saying, I am trash, which is what, now I'll give you, like, maybe 60, about right 80% of the time I do. 20% of the time I'm saying, how do they do it? I want to learn how they do it. I'm watching sermons by people who I believe are good shepherds and trying to figure out how did you do it? I've sat down with older men for 15 years now trying to say, how do you do it? Because God has given shepherds so that I will be equipped. So if I don't do something well, I can't just sit on my hands and complain and not being good. He's given the gift of shepherds around me to say, hey, how do you lead a marriage? How do you lead children? This is how terrible I do, help me. He's giving me shepherds so that they would equip. And I promise you, if a man is a shepherd, he will want to help. He will want to equip. Don't just sit there and admire people. We're not called to admire. We're called to be like Christ. Stop admiring people and ask them how they did it so you can do it. But he's not just giving us the gift of a shepherd. He's given us shepherding gifts. I'm going to go through a bunch really quickly. Romans 12, 1 Corinthians 12, you can go there to get more, but I'm just going to highlight some. Romans 12 says that God has actually given a spiritual gift of mercy. What that means is compassion. There are people who have a spirit-led compassion for people that others don't. And here's what's so important about that. The spiritual gift of mercy will not allow a sheep to be left behind. A person who's apostolic and, and leaning, who's ready to climb up the mountain and leave the sheep who are too weak, that person needs some gifting. They need the gifting of mercy so they don't leave the sheep. He's given a, a spiritual gift of giving. This is so awesome because this is practical. Giving in the New Testament is giving so that all the saints would be able to be okay. You know, the New Testament church, what they actually did was they sold a bunch of stuff and they laid it at the apostles' feet and they distributed it to people so that no one would be without lack. <laughs> that sounds scary to some of you, but that's what they did. And it was a spiritual gift that God would give some people uh, an, an immense amount of anointing to want to give so that other people would be taken care of. That is how he leads us into green pastures. That is one of the ways that we shall not want. We have a small church. Most of us are broke. But at one point, I want us to have the vision that we would be able to take care of the sheep, that we would practically be able to lead people into green pastures. Not so that they would have a Ferrari and we would have a hoopty, but so that we would not lack as a church. He's given a spiritual gift of administration. 
This is so important. I used to view this administration as somebody who could file papers really well. But that's not actually what it is. When you understand it, it means it actually comes from a word that means to lead a ship. It's a spiritual gifting that gives that empowers people to lead an organization well. There are some people who can preach well, who can teach well, who can make disciples, who can evangelize, but they can't lead organizations for nothing. And they need gifting for that. It's me. <laughs> Those are just regular gifts, gifts that look regular. They look natural, but they're spirit and empowered. But let me give you a couple supernatural ones. One is healing. There are people who are actually broken, who are actually beat up. Did you know that part of the elders of a church, it says that, that if anyone is sick, let him come before the elders where they will anoint him with oil and pray for his healing and he will be healed. That is a practical, real life. If you are sick, come to the elders of the church, pray for healing. God will heal you. He will literally bound up your brokenness. Some people have elders in the church who don't even believe in healing. They're not biblically qualified to be an elder. How can you be an elder when the Bible and not believe in healing, not believe in the supernatural? And the Bible says that if someone is sick in the church, they're supposed to go to the elders who first have to believe in healing to be healed. Discerning of spirits or some of your Bibles may have distinguishing of spirits. It means being able to tell if there was something that is good spiritually happening or something that was bad spiritually happening. You guys remember when Paul is um, they're out there preaching the gospel and there is a slave girl who is who has a demon. But here's the thing. The demon is following them around in the girl and the girl is saying these men are proclaiming the truths of God. Good stuff. Right. But Paul turns around and he pulls a spirit out of the girl. Isn't that crazy? It wasn't that the demon was saying anything bad, but Paul knew that just because a demon doesn't say anything bad, it does not mean that the demon does not mean harm for you. But because he had a spiritual gift of distinguishing between good and evil, he was able to act on that. Pastors need to be able to distinguish between good spirits and bad spirits. And if you are being pastored, I want you to understand something. You may not always distinguish it. So that means your friend, your buddy, your boyfriend, your girlfriend, they may be led by a different spirit that the pastor discerns and understand it's not personal if they tell you your friend is not coming here because their first job is to guard the sheep. We are not, shepherds are not called to build an assembly of sheep and wolves so that the wolves and the sheep both think that the pastor is a nice person. Absolutely not. Distinguishing of spirits is seeing the wolves in the spirit. It's seeing wolves before they show themselves to be wolves. You're not going to do it perfectly, but God has given gifting for these things. If you're a pastor and you're watching and this somehow comes across your table, you should be asking for these gifts. I'm not killing it in all of these things. I want these gifts. I want to be better equipped as a pastor. And God has given spiritual gifts for these things. So this is my last word. I got six minutes and I'll get them done in four. I have two words for the shepherd, one word for the sheep. You guys ready for this? Two words for the shepherd, one for the sheep. First word for the shepherd, be sobered by your calling. Understand that God has called you to shepherd his sheep and he has the same ferocity. <laughs> That's it, ferocity? ferociousness, ferociousness of love and care for a sheep that he did in Ezekiel 34. And he is not playing around. It doesn't mean that you need to lead in constant fear. It doesn't mean that you need to lead trying to be um, 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 perfect. But what it does mean is that you need to lead sobered, knowing that God, the father of his children, is entrusting them to you. What that means is it's very much like if I say, hey, I'm going on a trip and I need you to watch my child. You know that I'm not expecting you to watch them perfectly. There are going to be some things that I wouldn't do that if you told me about, I'd probably be like, I don't want you to do that. There will be some things that I'm like, hey, don't do that again. But it means that you're going to be sobered with the responsibility of it. If you are a pastor and you don't have that sobering responsibility, something's wrong. Hebrews 13, 7 says that, that shepherds keep watch over your souls. And that we will, be give, we will give an account for what we do with them. 
Like that's what it means. It means when I go to the grave and I open up my eyes, God is going to, he is actually going to hold me responsible. Not fully. Everybody has their own responsibility, but part of my responsibility, he's going to say, how did you lead your wife? How did you lead your son? How did you lead Ale, Louis, Danielle? All, he's going to, everyone in the church. You still want to be a pastor? Some of y'all want to be leaders of 10,000 churches. But the Bible says that you are keeping watch of every single one of their souls and you will be held accountable. Don't let that fear you, but let it sober you. That means that you need to leave, live a life on your face because you need God to do it. Second word for shepherds. Don't just lead in God's truth, but lead in his heart. Lead in his heart. First uh, Peter uh, 5, 2 through 4 says this, shepherd the flock among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but voluntarily, according to the will of God, not for gain, but with eagerness, nor yet is lording it over those who allot, who those allotted to your charge, but proving to be examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive unfading glory. This is saying is just shepherd for the right reason. Shepherd with the right heart first internally. That you're there not for men. You're not there because you just have a lot of messages you want to get out. You're not there because you have a lot of zeal and you just want to yell it in front of people. You're not there because you couldn't get a job anywhere else, but you can get people to come and pay you to preach. You're not there because you like the spot. You're there because you're serving God. Leading is not a position that you hold over the flock. It's a position for them to see you in front. Imaging Christ. He says, he says, he says, don't lord it over them, but prove to be examples. Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. This is insanely important to God. So it's first you have your heart right on the inside. But second, you have your heart right towards people. Moses is a great example of this. I don't know if you guys remember this, but there was a time. Well, first off. As he's leading the people of Israel, there's this constant complaining from Israel. Oh, they, they, they saw God. They saw God part the ocean or part the sea. They saw him do. They saw him have a pillar of fire by night. They saw him bring food from the clouds. And they constantly complain. The last time they complained, oh, we're thirsty, we're thirsty. Instead of just saying, hey, we're thirsty. Remember how you gave us water before? Can you give us water again? Knowing that, why would he bring you to Egypt to die? Instead of all of that, oh, I'm thirsty, we're thirsty. They're whining and complaining and moaning. But I want you to understand something. So they tell Moses. Moses goes to God. He says, I'm going to give him water out of a rock. And Moses replies this way. He says, you, I'm paraphrasing, you rebels, here, take this, take this water. Pat, pat, bangs his staff on the rock. You know God's response to, to, to him? He says in Numbers 20, 12, he says, because you have not believed me to treat me as holy in the sight of the sons of Israel. Therefore, you shall not bring this assembly to the land which I've given them. God responds to Moses and says, everybody's going to the promised land except for you. Why? Because he says, you didn't keep my name holy. Your actions, what you did with that rock does not show. You, you're showing them you're supposed to image me and you're showing them that I get angry when they disobey, when they complain like you do. And I don't respond like that. See, when we are impatient and angry with those God has called us to lead, it's because we lose sight of the fact that we are sheep, too. See, the problem was when you read Exodus, you see that for almost every complaint that Israel does, Moses complains just as much. But Moses didn't see his complaining. He only saw Israel's complaining. And he had the audacity to be angry with them when God was never angry with him. This is, this is like, and this is my weakness. I can look at other people, especially people that I'm leading. I can get frustrated. But the reality is I have to understand that it is only God's patience and mercy and kind, it's kindness that has saved me. And I need it. If I need it, I need to be able to give it to people. How dare I not extend the same long suffering to those he has put under my care. So those are, Three words, two, sorry, that's two. Uh, two for the shepherd, last one is for the sheep. All right.
Last one, and then I'm done. This is um, this is right in the middle of his whole diatribe in Ezekiel 34 against the shepherds. He's saying, you shepherds are leaving terribly. And then on one side and on the other side, he's saying, I'm, co I'm coming, I'm going to, 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 to bring my own shepherd. But right in the middle, in Ezekiel 34, 17 and 19, he says this, as for you, my flock, he turns to the flock themselves. Everybody's accountable here. As for you, my flock, behold, I will judge between one sheep and another, between the rams, that's a, that's a male sheep, and the male goats. Is it too slight a thing for you, that you should feed in the good pasture, that you must tread down with your feet the rest of the pastures, or that you should drink of the clear waters, that you must foul the rest with your feet? As for my flock, they must eat what you tread down with your feet and drink with what, foul with what you foul with your feet. What's he saying here? He's saying, okay, these guys aren't leading well. I'm coming to lead better, but I'm also holding you accountable, you who claim to be sheep. And the first thing that he says, I'm going to divide between the sheep and the goats. If you don't know biblically, um, God says at the, at, at, in Revelation at the end times, he's going to divide between sheep and goats. The sheep represent God's people. The goats represent people who look like God's people, but they are not God's people. Let me say this again so you hear it. The sheep represent God's people. The goats represent people who look like God's people, but they are not God's people. And you got to understand something about sheep and goats. Sheep are submissive by nature. It's one of the reasons why we call sheep stupid when really there's no intelligence difference between a sheep and a goat. We just call sheep stupid, but really because we are human beings and we don't like listening, we don't like submission, we view uh, sheep's submission as weakness. Goats are completely different. See, a sheep, I've done a lot of research on sheep and goats recently. <laughs> the sheep, sheep actually feel more comfortable with the flock. It doesn't take much. Once a sheep trusts the shepherd, it doesn't take much for the sheep to be led by the shepherd. Goats, on the other hand, goats will always go their own way. You can't pasture a goat because a goat will jump over the fence and go eat on twigs and berries. Whatever you put in front of a goat, it will eat. You can put your shirt in front of a goat, it'll eat. It doesn't matter what it does this inside. A goat does what it wants to do. A shepherd cannot lead a goat because a goat refuses to follow. God says, yeah, these shepherds were bad. I'm coming to do it well, but be clear. I'm going to make a distinction in my flock between sheep and goats. Some of us, the problem that we're bumping into is not the shepherds. It's not the good shepherd. It's not the bad shepherd. The problem is we, we may be sheep, but we're moving like goats. Some of, some of you are just not sheep and you're goats. No, that sucks to hear, but it's just true. And it's better that you know that you're a goat so you can be a sheep than to think you're a sheep and actually be a goat. God has given shepherds to shepherds. You know one of the ways to, to, to know? Submit yourselves. Hebrew, Hebrews 13, 7 actually says this. This is the whole thing. It says, yes, it says, leaders, they keep watch over your souls. You, they will give an account. But look at what it says before that. It says, obey your leaders and submit to them. Why? Because they will give, they will, they keep watch over your souls and they will give an account. But then he says this, let them do this with joy and not with grief for this would be unprofitable for you. There's blessing in submitting to leadership. And that's not just me saying that to my church, my church, I'll be honest with you. I'm happy with them. Like, I don't, I don't think like we have a, a church of, of, of sheep, like people willfully submit, not because it's me. It's because they want to follow Christ. Let me, let me just tell you this. If you are, and this isn't just the church, guys, I am called as a 35 year old man to honor my mother and father. I am called to submit to leadership of, of governing authorities. I am called to submit in areas of life. So even if it's not a church thing or it's, it's a, it's a um, parent thing or if it's authority thing, we are called to submit. Let me, let me just say this and I, and I want this to sober you. If you have a constant issue with submitting to authority, you better check to make sure you're not growing horns. What I mean is like that you're not a goat. We should not have a problem with submitting. We should do it with, with joy because it's going to be profitable for us. Submitting to a shepherd means that you are being protected. You are being fed. So I'm past my time. So let me, let me 
pray for us, and then we'll be done. Um, this is what I'll tell you, though. Um, as you go out, I want you to take this not just for your, not just like, oh, okay, this is how I should be led. Um, this is how I should, but understand that there are places that you should be equipped as a shepherd as well. There are people that God will put in your place and you should go back, rewatch this sermon from the standpoint of a leadership. So let me be done. Lord Jesus, I thank you for this time. I thank you for your word. I thank you that you have given me substance to preach because you have already said everything that I've had to say. You've already written it in your word. You've given me your spirit and you've given people who are listening your spirit so that it testifies that this is coming from you. I thank you for this time. I pray that you would bless it, Lord. I pray that you would let, let this resonate for people. And I pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. My heart, I just want to hear.